Hi, I'm Sam Hawley, coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people. This is ABC News Daily. There's going to be a new trial starting next year in the case against Bruce Learman, who's accused of raping Brittany Higgins. Mr Learman has always maintained his innocence. The initial jury was discharged after misconduct by one juror. He was found to have had research material not permitted by the court. Today, criminal justice expert Julia Quilter on the complexity of rape trials. Julia, the jury has been discharged in the Bruce Learman trial. Brittany Higgins spoke outside the court about the judicial process. I told the truth, no matter how uncomfortable or unflattering, to the court. When I did speak up, I never fully understood our asymmetrical criminal justice system. But I do now. I was required to tell the truth under oath for over a week on the witness stand and was cross-examined at length. I was required to surrender my telephones, my passwords, messages, photos and my data. Mr Learman maintains his innocence, but I want to talk to you more widely about the justice system and rape cases. What, first of all, do the statistics show us? Well, broadly speaking, the statistics tell us that convictions are quite low in this area of the law. Mm -hmm. But in addition, we do see a lot of attrition, that is people not progressing uh, with a complaint of sexual assault or rape, whether that is not reporting to the police in the first place and then issues to do with whether or not the police determine that there is insufficient evidence to continue with an investigation or prosecutors determine that there is insufficient evidence to try that matter. And we also have, at times, uh, complainants who don't want to proceed Mm. with the criminal justice system. It's very difficult to run a trial of this nature if the complainant is not prepared to continue. Mm, So it sounds like not many, percentage-wise, actually end up in court. No, well, the um, Australian Bureau of Statistics do a sexual violence survey and their most recent one indicates that while 639,000 women experienced sexual assault in the past 10 years, only 13% of those women reported that experience to police. So only 86,000. So we've got a massive attrition rate from what has happened to whether or not complainants decide to report. Mm, And how many of those that do report to police, how many of those proceed to a court of law? Well, that's, again, there's a very significant um, number of those that don't proceed Mm. and there are a variety of reasons for that, whether that's there's not enough um, evidence to continue or alternatively a complainant decides no longer to continue with that complaint. For complainants, um, they're aware of the potential difficulty of being involved with the criminal justice system and knowing that uh, their life is going to be under scrutiny. The other thing, you know, the ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, also, you know, surveys, what, why, why did you decide not to report And some of the more common reasons are things like embarrassment. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to be subjected to various forms of um, investigation as to their behaviour. So there are a range of reasons why complainants decide not to um, continue. But I should note here that sometimes it's perceived that they don't continue because they're lying. And Mm. in my view, and I think all of the evidence suggests that is rarely the reason. It's rather because complainants decide that for them it's um, going to be too difficult to go through the criminal justice system. Mm. Let's have a look then at 
those very small number of cases that do make it to trial. Mm -hmm. What, in your view, are the biggest barriers once they're in the court? Well, like any trial, the complainant's evidence is going to be tested and heavily tested. Mm. That's the case for any trial. Any important witness will be questioned as to their reliability and their credibility. Mm -hmm. And those things are not unusual in any criminal trial. And so I think in the case of uh, complainants in sexual assault matters, um, their testing of their credibility and reliability takes on a different kind of ramification. But the other thing I would say in relation to these kinds of matters is that there are often only two people present. And that's not the case in many other criminal prosecutions. And so the complainant's evidence is essential uh, to either a successful conviction or otherwise. Mm, So the cross-examination can be difficult in this case to actually sit in the courtroom and be cross-examined by a legal team. That's right. Now, I should say that most complainants give their evidence from what is known as a remote location um, through the usage of CCTV, which are protective provisions that have been introduced for many, many years now. Mm -hmm. That's not to say a complainant can't ask to give their evidence in a courtroom, and typically the courtroom is closed. But in terms of that cross-examination, the experience I have of reading trial transcripts, particularly in New South Wales and in Victoria, is that the focus is not necessarily on the essential elements of the case, that is, was there or was there not consent to sexual activity and or what did the uh, accused person know, did they know the person was not consenting. Rather, it tends to look at a range of what I would call peripheral matters, which often have various rape myths built into them. Mm. What about the questioning, the cross-examination of the accused? What do we see there? Well, it depends because, of course, our criminal justice system is built on the fundamental and very important assumption of um, the presumption of innocence and the right to silence. An accused doesn't have to say anything in a trial, and that is perfectly a legitimate right that an accused person has. Mm. And in these types of trials, often no case is led for an accused person, but where they give evidence, of course, they will be subjected to the type of cross-examination by the Crown um, to assess whether or not they're telling the truth. Mm, How common is it that these cases would be heard before a jury rather than a judge alone? Typically, these matters are held before a jury because, you know, our jury system is based on a judgment of peers. Mm -hmm. In terms of, you know, life experience, sexual assault is understood to be one that should be judged through our peers rather than just, for instance, in a judge alone. Of course, an accused person can request in most um, jurisdictions to have a judge alone trial, and there may be good justice reasons to do so. Mm, How often is it that juries in rape cases can't reach verdicts? It's a really good question, and um, I'm not sure of the actual statistics, but in these kinds of cases, we've seen some Uh, high-profile cases in New South Wales where juries have been unable to decide Mm. on not just one count but on numerous counts and so ultimately the jury has to be discharged and then a decision has to be made as to whether a second or even potentially a third trial uh, will be held. Mm. Given the complexities that we've spoken about, the difficulties in terms of witnesses giving evidence, of cross-examination, of the difficulties of having juries, what needs to change, Julia, in your view? Well, it's a tricky question because, you know, there has been a, a progressive law reform project going on since the 1980s in Australia to reform the criminal laws around sexual assault and rape cases. Mm. And I think we've come a very long way in that period of time. In terms of further reform, I don't think further tweaks to legislation is necessarily the answer. And of course, across Australia, we've just had a round of reforms in relation to what is known as affirmative consent. Those reforms are good, 
But if they don't actually get put into place in the courtroom, then we've got a problem. So I think there could be better usage of expert evidence to talk about a, a more common or typical reaction of a complainant, for example, why they may delay in complaining. We use this type of evidence in child sexual assault matters for good reason. Um, and I also think there could be a role for a pilot study in relation to judge alone trials that are specialised. And they have to be specialised judges in sexual assault matters. And we do this again in child sexual assault matters and other countries such as New Zealand have been piloting this type of approach. For so many women across the country, it's really important that the justice system gets this right. Indeed it is. (laughs) So how quickly should they be acting to really bring about some sort of reform? Well, sexual assault matters are one of the most commonly prosecuted usually in the district court, depending on the structure of the court system. So they're a high volume matter. So in terms of getting this right for complainants, it's essential because they comprise such a large number of the trials. Julia Quilter is a professor at the School of Law at the University of Wollongong. If this discussion has raised issues for you, you can call 1800 RESPECT, 1800 737 732. This episode was produced by Sydney Peed and Chris Dengate, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer is Stephen Smiley. Over the weekend, catch ABC Sport Daily with Pat Stack. That'll be in the ABC News Daily feed. I'm Sam Hawley. I'll be back on Monday. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.